Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 20. Please stand with me today. You follow along. We're just going to read to the end of the chapter, beginning in verse 20 of Deuteronomy 6. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondsmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from therein that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Let me speak to you about verse 23. He brought us out to bring us in. Father, we thank you again now for your goodness to us today. Lord, thank you again for your watch, care, and for your kindnesses to us. Thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to be here one more time. Lord, Thank you for your love and your mercy to us. Thank you for heaven. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, thank you that one day, one day, one day, the trumpet shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Father, we, we look at the things that are happening round about us we're reminded in Matthew 24, Jesus, you said, all oh, these are the beginning of sorrows. So, Lord, uh, help us to be in a state of anticipation that Jesus will come. He shall come, maybe today. Father, we pray for America again. We lift up our country. We pray for our president, Lord, uh, whether you agree with everything he does, which, of course, we don't, Lord, I believe, he does, I believe he does love our country, and he's trying to do what's right. And So, Lord, just help it, I pray. Lord, we pray for his salvation. Lord, I don't know whether the president is a saved, born-again man or not, but if he is, Lord, great. If he's not, then dear God, I pray. Lord, I think of Vice President Pence. Lord, I know that guy's saved. He's born again. Lord, help the vice president be a, a godly influence on our president. Lord, I pray for us who are here today. Father, I pray that your hand of protection would be upon us. Lord, I, I think of that, that uh, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. Lord, we, we think of that today. Uh, Lord, we shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor for the arrow that flies by day. Oh God, we thank you, Lord, for your hand of protection. Lord, we, we, we know that Christians get sick sometimes. We know that, Lord. But, oh, gracious Father in heaven, we are praying and asking today, Lord, that thou would keep us safe. Lord, even as we travel to our homes today, that, Lord, you would watch over us. Father, again, we thank you so very, very much, Lord, for all that you've done for us now. Bless in the few minutes. Lord, I pray for those who are watching by TV today, that, Lord, you'll bless them too. And, Lord, that you'll encourage them too. Lord, uh, help us to think of them even as if they were here today. And Lord, I, we pray, Lord, your hand of blessing upon this church and upon the people. Lord, we pray. Thank you again for all you've done for us. Lord, help me to say now what you would have me to say, Lord, in such a way that people might get it, might understand it. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You may be seated. He brought us out to bring us in. He brought us out to bring us in. I think it was probably about, oh, I think I was like 10 years old. I, I, I was probably somewhere around there. And I, I did not know how to swim. How many do not know how to swim? You don't know how to, oh, shame on you, shame on you. I can teach you to swim in like three seconds. But anyway, but I would go up. We had a local pool in our area where we lived. I think it, it, was, a, it was privately owned, but it was a local pool. And I... I believe at the time it cost 50 cents to get in. Uh, you could buy a season pass, of course, and what it cost 50 cents. And 
And I had a friend, and at that time I could not swim. And I had a friend who said to me, well, if you jump in, if you just jump in the deep water, you'll come back up. And I'm looking at him like, man, I might have got off the boat yesterday, but it wasn't last night, you know? I mean, I, I, and, and I, I, I didn't do it. And then the next day, he said, just jump in. Just jump in, you'll be all right. Just jump in the water. And I said, no way, I'm jumping in that water. He said, look, I'll show you. He jumped in the water. You know, it was, it was deep along the side. He jumped in, came right back up. He said, you will do that. No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I won't come back. I'm, I'm afraid that I'll drown. I'm afraid that I, I won't, you know, uh, I'm fearful jumping in the water. And every day he would badger me, just say, jump in the water. It'll be all right. I guarantee it. I'll get him beside the pool. Just jump in right there. He said, if you go to the bottom, you can push up and grab the side. No, I can't do that. I'm not able. I can't do that. I'll drown. I'm a 10-year-old kid, you know, and, and I'm thinking, well, I'll drown if I do that. But he kept after me. Just jump in. You'll be all right. You know, it's like that Mikey. Try it. You'll like it. You know, he said to me, he said, just jump in. So I jumped in. And I drowned. But my father made me walk it off. So here I am. Though. I jumped in. I jumped in and... Much to my surprise, I came back up. I came right back up. Now, he said, jump out about a foot. Now, I can't swim. But I said, okay, I'll try it. I jumped out about a foot, and I, like that, and I got to the edge. Now, I said, jump out a little bit farther. And I did. And I made it back. And then, he said, okay. Now let's go out to the diving board. I said, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Now, now we're talking real water. That's really deep. No, he said, do this. He said, jump off the side toward the ladder. Oh, okay, I can do that. So I jumped off the side of the diving board toward the ladder, came up like I found out I would, and then I doggy paddled over to the side. Now he said, jump out a little bit farther. So I did. Now this time I'm Swimming like Johnny Weissmuller, you know, old Tarzan movies. Man, I'm just, I'm going through the water like a crocodile behind me. Now I said, jump off the front of the diving board. I said, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Well, why can't you do that? You jumped off the edge, yeah. You jumped off the side, yeah. Jump off the front of the diving board. So I jumped off, and you know how little kids, they try to lean over like this, and they always manage to do a belly flop. Well, I did. That's what it was. Boy, did it sting. But then I... I began to learn diving. I think the, the place was Schinberger's, and that was the name of it, the, the guy that owned it. And pretty soon, man, I'm diving down to the bottom at 12 feet, and I'm swimming up, and I'm swimming all over the pool. And if you don't know how to swim, I can teach you. <laughs> if you don't know how to swim, shame on you. I mean that. But I was fearful. I was afraid to jump in the water because I was afraid that I wouldn't come back up. I got over that kind of fast. First time I jumped in and I came back up, I said, hey, it really does work. It really does work. I, I really can. Now, you probably over your lifetime have heard many times, man, either sink or swim, sink or swim. Uh, but, you know, do something, but just jump in. I mean, my friend just kept badgering me till after, till after a while I got sick of hearing it, so I jumped in, and I jumped in, and lo and behold, I came back up to the top. I got over being afraid kind of fast. I love to swim, now. Now, there are some things I won't do. The bridge going over the Black River there in, in the Lions Falls, that uh, over the Black River, that bridge there. Timmy jumped off of that bridge. I'm not going to do that. I might swim, but I'm not going to jump off the bridge. But, you know, but I, it, it's, you know, sink or swim. 
Do something. Sink or swim. In Deuteronomy, the writer, of course, at this point is still Moses. He said, he brought us out to bring us in. He took us out to bring us in. Listen, God has not saved us. <coughs> Excuse me. God has not saved us to the point where, well, I'm afraid to go forward in the Christian life. I'm afraid that, that, that I, I won't be able to do it. I, I've had people say to me before, Preacher, I don't know how to live the Christian And I've failed so many times. I just don't think that I can do that. And the truth of the matter is, and, and I've said this before, the sooner you figure out that you're a failure, the better off you're going to be because it's when we realize that we're a failure that we begin to rely upon the Lord God Almighty. Well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I won't be able to do it. Look at Joshua chapter 13. Or Joshua chapter 13, real quickly. Let me give you three things this morning, if I might, about being paralyzed by fear. Joshua 13. I know people, probably you do too, who I believe are paralyzed by fear. Now, now I was about the swimming thing. I was afraid to jump in the water. I, I would not jump in the water. I was paralyzed by that until I got over the thing of, about being afraid of, of the water. I love the water now. I love to swim. Uh, sometimes, to our, our, sometimes to our detriment when, when uh, Mrs. Jenkins, I mean when Carol, Mrs. Jenkins is my mother, but when Carol and I were married, we were, uh, now if you're not married, I'm just saying this, if to you who are not married, I wouldn't advise you to go camping on your honeymoon. I just, I, I'm telling you right now, I'm giving you some advice on that one. Yeah. We were out riding on some rafts out in the ocean, and, you know, the next thing I, I look in and I say, I say to her, hey, we're getting out a little far. We better start paddling in. Well, we were just, we're getting further. And I said, well, look, jump off the raft, hold on to the raft, and swim in. We still weren't getting anywhere. I said, leave the raft and let's just swim in. So I'm doing my Johnny Weissmuller interpretation, and I turn around, she's gone. I, she's nowhere. So I turn, I turn back around. You know, it's, you need to have a little bit of fear. I mean, the ocean is a pretty big place to hear about the guys. How long were those two fishermen lost? out in the Gulf or off the coast, I think it was like, it couldn't have been eight weeks, but they just found him alive. But fearful of, of, of water. I got over the fear of it. God said about Israel, I brought them out to bring them in. Well, into what? Well, Joshua chapter 13 and verse 1 says this. It says, in verse 1 it says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that ye, this is the land that yet remaineth. All the borders, and it goes down, gives all the, how much territory that they had left to conquer. Now God brought Israel out of Egypt. When we read there in Josh, or I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 6, well, what are we supposed to tell our kids? Well, you tell your kids that once you were slaves to Pharaoh and that God worked miracles. Remember the ten miracles? Uh, God worked miracles to get them out. He brought them out of the land of Egypt. <coughs> Excuse me. He brought them out of the land of Egypt to bring them into the promised land. Now, there are three things about being paralyzed by fear, particularly in the spiritual realm. When we think about, you know, uh, and, and there are people who have all kinds of phobias. People are afraid of heights. Uh, people are afraid of, there are people are afraid of germs. Um, snakes, yeah, some people are afraid of snakes. 
If I said how many, and there are people who are afraid of spiders, how many like spiders? How many don't like spiders? How many are afraid of spiders? Okay, we got a couple. I believe that's called anacrophobia. Sounds good to me. But anyway, <clears throat> you know, so people are afraid of things. My mother always used to say to us, mother, she would always say to us, wash your hands. Hey, wait a minute. Did your mother ever tell you don't go outside with wet hair after a bath, you'll get pneumonia? Anybody ever, mom ever, mom ever say that to you? Yeah. Mom used to say to us, one of mom's sayings was, wash your hands or you'll get hydrophobia. <laughs> now you know what hydrophobia is, right? Fear of water. People who have hydrophobia are usually people with rabies. Oh, you don't want to get that. You don't want to get that. But mother would always say, wash your hands or you'll get hydrophobia. Well, as a kid, you don't, oh, mother said it, it must be true. I've read since then that you need to eat like a half a bushel of dirt through your lifetime to be kind of healthy. Well, you know, so now during this uh, time period, I probably wash my hands more than normal, uh, you know, but, but people have fears in their lives. People, people, some people will not get on an airplane. John Madden, who was the uh, football coach and then a, a sports announcer uh, for CBS for many years, he traveled from city to city in a bus because he was afraid to get on an airplane. And uh, just, just, people are just fearful. People are fearful to try to live the Christian life because they're afraid of failure. They're, they're afraid they'll fail. I can't tell you how many times I've failed, how many times I dropped the ball, fumbled the ball, missed the ball. And people are afraid. But I, I, I know people, I know people, and probably you do too, that they are afraid to try to experience anything in life because they're afraid that they might fail, that they might fail. Now, three things, if I might, about failure. One, one is this about, if I can say this, the, the insubordination in the Christian life, the insubordination of failure. Say, so what do you mean by that, preacher? Well, simply this, that God said to the Israelites, I brought you out to bring you in. I did not bring you out to leave you out. See, Joshua, there's still a lot of land to be conquered. There's still much land to be conquered. Now, he was old. Israel, <coughs> excuse me, Israel never did conquer all the land, at least under Joshua, all the land that they were supposed to conquer. But God did not bring Israel out of Egypt to wander around. And so the insubordination, <coughs> excuse me, I got it, I got it, I got it. Let's say, what's wrong, preacher? I can't remember my allergies were quite this bad. Maybe some of you experienced that, but anyway, all right, here we go. The insubor insubordination of it. God... God does not know the term, what if. We say, well, what if God doesn't provide for us? What if I get sick? I read this week, uh, David Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh's brother. David Limbaugh is a believer. He, he, he wondered for a time, four times, and uh, he read something Ravi Zacharias said. And um, it, it, he said, reading what Ravi Zacharias said, he said was one of the pivotal turning points in his life to become a believer in Christ. When David Limbaugh's brother Rush got sick several months ago, he didn't get sick. He, um, usually people with lung cancer don't know they have lung cancer because the lungs have no feeling and until the tumor gets big enough to push on something else. So Limbaugh was probably sick. The doctor told my father he was probably had lung cancer with a type of lung cancer he had three or four, two to three years before he, it actually showed up. So when Rush Limbaugh was diagnosed with it, Ravi Zacharias sent a letter to David Limbaugh about three and a half months ago and said, I am praying for your brother that he might be healed. Three months later, Ravi Zacharias 
at the time he wrote the David Limbaugh, he said, I have this terrible pain in my back. Little did he know that three months later, he himself would be dead from cancer. Well, what if God doesn't heal me? God, look, God doesn't even know that term, what if. God, it's like Hezekiah. Hezekiah, if you, you read in the book of Isaiah, Hezekiah was besieged by Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. <clears throat> and he sent word to Hezekiah and said, hey, listen, pal, if you think that your God will deliver you, you better think twice. Because there's not been one God that has been able to deliver any other king out of my hand. Hezekiah prays. Somewhere in Isaiah, about 28, 29, somewhere around there. Hezekiah prays to God and says, God, will, 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 will you do something for us? God, would you deliver us? Well, what if God doesn't deliver us? What if he doesn't? Remember the three Hebrew children? Nebuchadnezzar said to those guys, Hey, listen, I'm going to give you one more chance. When the trumpets and the cornet and all those instruments blow, if you will bow down to the golden image, I'll spare you. But if not, whose God shall deliver you? One of those three guys, they just said, We are not careful to answer thee, O king. And in a paraphrase, they said this, we will, when the music blows, we will not bow down. Now, they said, if God wants to deliver us out of the fire, he can. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, we will not bow down to you. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, got very, very angry and heated the furnace seven times hotter than it normally was. Evidently, they were thrown in from above. I can't quite picture it, but they were thrown in from above. And the guys that went to throw them in, they got killed. The fire was so hot. But Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not cast three men in there? Well, I see four men walking unbound, unhurt in the midst of the fire. And the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God doesn't know a what if. God commanded Israel to conquer all the promised land. You'll remember at Cadiz Barnea, they had, been, they had been to Mount Sinai, they had gotten the law, they had almost got exterminated because Moses was gone so long and Moses came down and they had made a golden calf and the people were dancing naked all around it, and God said, I'm going to kill every one of them. And Moses said, Moses intervened for them and said, in Exodus 32, he said, if, if, if you don't spare them, if you don't spare them, then, and there's a dash in the Bible. Moses said, if you're not going to spare them, then just take care of me too. They got by that, they got to Caris Barnea. You know, remember they sent in the 12 spies. I'm not sure why they sent the 12 spies in, but they sent the 12 spies in and they came back. Ten of them said, yes, it is the land that floweth with milk and honey. It is a land where the grapes of Esco grow. It's a tremendous place. But there are giants in the land. And we'd be not able to take it. Joshua and Caleb said, well, wait a minute. Hang on just a second. Basically said this, if God be for us, who can be against us? But Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, there are giants in the land. Yeah, there are big people in that land. But we be able, if God is for us, to do it. And the people believed the ten. Moses said to them at that point, he said, all right, listen. Because you have not believed what God said about going in, that I'll help you do it. See, they were insubordinate to what God said. I brought you out to bring you in. I did not bring you out to leave you here in the wilderness. <clears throat> you know what the wilderness, I'm gonna, let me say, 
two things. One, in the life of a Christian, the, going into the promised land is living the victorious life. That's what it is, not heaven, because in heaven there won't be any more battles. Going into the Canaan land and conquering Canaan is a victorious Christian life. But Israel said, we can't do it. And so for 40 years, they wandered in a big circle. They just kept going around in a circle and going around in a circle until everybody from the age of 18 or 20, I think it's 20, everybody died. He said, well, what is the wilderness picture? You want to know what the wilderness pictures? It pictures the, it pictures the average Christian today. See, God never intended for them just to wander in a circle. You know, just kept going around in a big circle. God intended, it was like a 40-day trip from Egypt to the promised land. Maybe. Maybe it was 18. But anyway, it wasn't very long. It might have been a couple months that they went from Egypt to get to the promised land. Three million plus people. And God would have had them go into the promised land, the victorious Christian life. Ah, no, we can't do that. God said, I, I told you to go on in. Go on into the promised land. Go into the promised land. Go into it. Ah, we can't do that. There are giants in the land. Noah, again, I, I, I think this to be true. It's me. If you don't think so, it's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. When God told Noah to build an ark, Again, it didn't take him 120 years. It probably took him anywhere from 65 to 75 years to actually build the ark. But anyway, Noah preached righteousness for like 120 years. Say, really? Really? And probably out here, there were probably some saved. I imagine Lamech, his father, and Methuselah, they probably were saved guys. There probably were some other saved people. But after 120 years, it's kind of like a funnel. They got down to here. There's only eight people that actually got on the ark. Noah finishes the ark, he's preaching. And I'm sure he was ridiculed. I'm sure he was made fun of. I'm sure that people called him all kinds of names. But Noah did not say, now again, you have to remember, the ark was probably from here to the corner, is how big it was. I mean, I can see why it took him 75 years to build that thing. But the ark was from here to the corner. It was probably from here to the other side of the road. And it was, I think, it was 75 feet high. I know it was. It was 75 feet high. The peak of the roof over there on my house is like 30 feet. So it was like two and a half times higher. Noah never said, I don't know if we can do this, God. I don't know, God. I, God did not say, I want you to build it if God said, I want you to build it. God said to the Israelites, I want you to go in to the land, not to be afraid. He said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, look back just a couple pages, Joshua chapter 1, Joshua 1. He said to Joshua, three times he said uh, to them in Joshua chapter 1, somewhere, he said this in verse 8, verse 7, verse 6, be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. Verse 8, Verse 9, I'm sorry, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. God commands us to enter into the, to the, every, into the victorious Christian life. When we refuse to do that, we are, we are insubordinate to God. Well, what if God doesn't help me? What if God doesn't? What if this? What if that? I'm sure... I know I did, that many people prayed for Ravi Zacharias. I prayed for God to heal him. The week that he died, the doctor sent him home and said, there's nothing else that can be done. Now, I know that God can work miraculously. I know that he can. I had a guy in, in my class, in, in preacher's class one day, he said his mother had a brain tumor. The preacher came the day they were going to operate on his mother, prayed over his mother. They, reeled, they wheeled his mother out. 
Bobby Branch wheeled his mother out. Half an hour later, they were back. And the tumor was gone. You say, wow. God really do stuff? Yes, God can do stuff like that. I pray for Robbie Zach. Well, what if God does? Look. God doesn't know what if. God simply commands us to live the Christian life. Um, he said, have I not commanded thee? Only be strong and of a good courage. They wandered for 40 years. Many Christians just constantly, they know they're, oh, I can't do this. And I've had people say this to me. I remember very clearly a guy came up to me one time and said, Preacher, I don't know how you do it. I can't do it. I, I just, I give up and I quit. I can't do it. See, when we fail to enter into the promised land, when we fail to do what God says, we are being, we are in, in subordination. Now, I don't know all that is involved, but boy, if you're insubordinate in the army, man, they throw you in the guardhouse for a while. Maybe they shoot you. I don't know. But being insubordinate to God. Again, wandering around in the wilderness today is the normal Christian life. Look, when you enter the promised land, you're going to have defeats. We, we, we get defeated from, uh, uh, at times. Spurgeon said it happens 10,000 times a day with him. I, I know he's exaggerating, but secondly, this, that if you look over at Hebrews chapter 3, not only the insubordination of, is of not going in, but if I can say it like this, Hebrews chapter 3, the immobilization of fear. Remember I, my story at, at first, I wouldn't get in the water because it was too deep. I'm going to drown. I can't do it. I, I just stood by. I watched everybody else do it. Everybody else is out there swimming, having a good time, and I'm on the side of the pool doing nothing. Because fear... Fear not only causes us to be insubordinate to God, but it causes us to be immobile. That we don't, we're afraid to go forward because we are afraid, we are fearful that we might fail. If, if I were and I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother to do that, but if I, if I said to everybody today, hey everybody, how many this week will say, I never did anything wrong at all this week? Now, don't raise your hand, because I know you're lying, and you will have ruined your record. I'm saying that everybody in church fails. We get mad at the wife. We get irritated. I get irritated sometimes. when uh, maybe he's watching, maybe he isn't. When Bob and I traveled south, I will say, I will just say this. He became provoked at some of the other drivers on the road. You, I know people don't like getting behind a bus. I know that. I'm well aware of that. I, and when, 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 you know, I've seen some, some, of, some of the drivers that drive there, it's like they have like 20 cars behind them. And they won't pull over and let anybody by. If you get behind me and I got a place to pull over, I'm going to pull over and let you by. But I know people don't like getting behind a bus, so they'll pull right out in front of you and then go about 25 miles an hour. So don't tell me you had a perfect week because I am no better. We get irritated. We get upset. Sometimes we say things that we ought not to say. But we become paralyzed by fear we are insubordinate to God and then we become immobilized by the fear that we have. Think about Israel. I know Brother uh, Stiles mentioned it last week. But you think about Israel at the Valley of Elah. 
they're up on one side and the, and the Philistines are on the other. And every day that big mouth Goliath comes down the hill and he challenges those guys. Somebody come out and fight me. And if you win, we'll be your servants. And they figure, man, this is a sure deal. There is absolutely no way Goliath is going to lose. But if you win, we'll serve you. But if I win, then you have to serve us. They, they, were, they were immobilized by the fear they had of the giant. Until David showed up. Now, you know, people often say, how old was David do you think he was? If you're asking, I'm telling you. You say, preacher, how old do you think he was? I think he was like 12, 13, or 14 years old. Goliath said, am I a dog that they send some kid out here? What he said is, am I a dog they send a kid out here to fight? They, they, they send a kid out here to fight against me. Am I a dog? What's he going to beat me with a stick? David just simply said, look, God delivered the lion and the bear to me, and God's going to deliver you, pal. I'm going to, if we can say it, I'm going to kill you, pal. And there is nothing that you can do about it. Not a thing. Because God, see, Saul, everybody else is hiding. They're immobilized. They're afraid. Did not God say, I'll fight your battles if you'll just, just, just trust me. But we become immobilized by fear and we're afraid to do anything. And if, if, if history proves anything, it proves that God knows what he's doing. Well, I don't know, preacher. You really think God knows what he's doing? Sure I do. I can say this in a general sense, that in general, God has a plan that is specific, that God is working the plan out. That's, you say, well, do you really think God knows what he's doing? The Bible says, thou art God alone. Among the gods, little g, there is none like unto thee. There's nobody like God. In the valley of Elah, they're down there and that Goliath is down there. But the people of Israel are fearful. They're afraid. They're afraid to step out until David shows up. They try to put Saul's arm on him, and it was so big, he clanking around like a, a little toy robot. He's clanking around, and David said, I can't wear this. And he goes down the hill, and he picks up those five smooth stones and put them in his, his shepherd bag, and and you know the rest of the story. He nails him right between the eyes and then he chops his head off. And then all the Philistines fled. They were, they were, they were the cowards. But See, when we, are, when we are paralyzed by fear in the Christian life, for example, look, you know me, I'm a big one about reading the Bible. I, I look, I will not tell you that I read the Bible every day, but out of 14 days, I read the Bible 13 days. Sometimes it just seems like, you know how life is, it gets really hectic. Somebody said, oh, I missed a day, preacher. I failed again. I failed again. I failed again, preacher. Preacher, I can't tell you how many times I've... And, and can I say this? I am going to say it. You say, preacher, I've asked God to forgive me of a sin so many times, I just, I, I think God's probably tired of me. Well, you don't know anything about grace. You don't know anything about mercy. If you, he's ready to forgive. A preacher, I failed. I failed in the matter of um, praying, or I failed in the matter of reading my Bible, or I failed. Just I just, I just failed, preacher, and and I, I'm so tired of failure that I just I I can't go on. If Israel had felt that way after the defeat at Ai, the only place they'd have lived is over by Jericho, and three million people in that little space would have been pretty crowded. But when we are fearful of what may, and somebody rightly said this, 90% of what we worry about never happens anyway. So all we've done is waste our life <coughs> worrying about things that are never going to come to pass. Well, what if I get cancer? God doesn't know anything about what if. 
I thought God would heal Robbie Vet Zacharias. Well, whether God healed him here or healed him there, God healed him. Amen. But we are fearful because we'll say, well, I tried, I tried, preacher, preacher, I tried. And now I'm to the point where I just don't, I just don't think I can do it anymore. I just don't think I can. Hebrews, we're in Hebrews chapter 3. I meant to say Hebrews chapter 3 and notice if you would, down about verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter in to his rest, but to them that believed not, to those that were fearful? So then, so we see that they could not enter in because they did not believe God, because of unbelief, because they were afraid of the giants. I'm telling you, every single person in this room has giants in their lives. Everybody does. Everybody has something, as Hebrews says, let us lay aside the sin which doth so easily beset us. So fear causes insubordination and it causes immobilization. But in Hebrews chapter 4, if you'll notice this, we are instructed by it. We are instructed by it. Let us, therefore, fear... Well, here's something to be afraid of. Let us fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. And if you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. I asked several weeks ago, what, is, what, is, what does it mean to be if we could define the word fearful, what does it mean? Well, it means being afraid of the unknown. Being afraid of the unknown. Kyle and I have talked many times about the fact that God knows the day of my death. God knows that. Uh, God knows when I'm going to die. So, why should I fear that? Well, you say, well, preacher, nobody knows what it's like to die. Well, that's true. But th the truth of the matter is that as we take our last breath here, we're going to be taking breath up there and, and we're going to live forever. But, and, I, and I understand because nobody has ever died. I have never died. And I know we read those stories about people who had near-death experiences. My opinion is if they were really dead, dead, they wouldn't have come back. They were mostly dead. But, but you know, so it's, it's like, well, we fear, we fear the unknown. We fear about tomorrow. We fear about money. We fear about the economy. We fear about disease. We fear about cancer, we fear about heart attacks, we fear about strokes, we fear about aneurysms, we fear about any number, we are afraid of spiders. But fear instructs us. Here those people were, who did not enter in? Those who were fearful. Ah, uh, we can't beat those giants. It's impossible for us to beat the giants, preacher. We just cannot do that. God, you may have provided, you may have provided in time past. And I know that David said, I am old and have been young, but one thing I have not seen, the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage? I... I would ask you this and think about this. God says to fear not. Do not worry. So I ask you this question this morning, brethren. Can we trust God? Can we trust God? Oh, preacher, it's easy for you to say you're the preacher. And I've thought about this many times lately. I talked to God about it. When we came here in 1980, there was no money. We bought the house and we and and for 40 we bought the house for $50,000 and 7 acres. We had to put 5,000 down and we had to have 5,000 by the next July 1st. If we had it July the 2nd, 
we would lose the original $5,000. Time, uh, the, the contract, time was of the essence. It had to be paid July the 1st, $5,000. Where are we going to get $5,000? How am I going to get, how are we going to live? What's going to happen? Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? The question I ask again is this. Can you trust God to get you through? Can you trust God? But we say, well, preacher, we live in such trouble sometimes. And, and I remind you, the Bible says that in <clears throat> the last days that perilous times shall come. But can we trust God? Let me give you this. So Moses died. And Moses said, okay, Joshua is going to be the man now. He's going to be the man that will lead you through over into the promised land. I have been with you for 40 years. It's time now for the next guy to step up. And Joshua is that guy. Moses dies. Uh, if up there was a map of Israel, okay, over on this side, and then there's the Jordan River, and over on that side, they were over there. They were on the other side of the Jordan. They had to get over there. God said to Joshua, okay, this is what we're going to do. He said, I'm going to part the Jordan River. And if you'll read the account, you'll, you'll see this. I, I, hadn't, I, I did not see this until lately. Here's what God said. I am not going to part the Jordan River until the sole of the feet of the priest touch the water. Well, what if he doesn't? Well, what, what, if, what, if, what if he doesn't part the river? Naaman the leper. God said to Naaman, or Elisha, yeah, Elisha said to Naaman, he said, Naaman comes, I've got this leprosy, I've got skin cancer, basically what it is. I've got skin cancer, I'm going to die. And Elisha says to him, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. Well, what if he doesn't heal me? What? God doesn't know what if. Naaman went down to the river. First he got mad and was going home. Said, well, the rivers of, of Syria are cleaner than the Jordan River. And somebody said to Naaman, if God would have told you something hard to do, would you have not have done it? Well, yeah. Then why not do something that he said was easy to do? And so Naaman goes over to the Jordan River, and God said seven times. He didn't say one time. He say two times. If it would have been you, you say, oh, preacher, I believe we can trust God to get us through. Really? Really? Do you really believe that? If God had said to you, go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times, after you came up the sixth time and there was no change, would you have gone down again? The great question is, can we trust God to get us through? Will God bring us through? He said, I, I brought you out to bring you in. But they were insubordinate in their fear. They were immobilized by fear. But the Bible instructs us that God will do exactly what he said he would do. And in Joshua chapter 3, it tells us that when the priest got up to the edge of the Jordan River and the river's flowing, I think, if I remember correctly, it had overflowed its banks. It was in the time of the flood season. They get up to the Jordan River. Would you have stuck your foot in? Would you have put your foot in? See, they didn't even have to put their foot in. All it says is that when the sole of the foot hits the water, the water's going to part. Would you have dipped in seven times? Would you have put your foot into the water? Oh, preacher, I don't know. God might not. Fearful. God says go. Well, I don't know, God. Insubordinate. 
Well, I'm so afraid, God, I'm so afraid, preacher, that if I jump into the pool, I'm not going to come back up and I'm going to drown. God says, jump in. I'll bring you back. He said, I, I did not bring you out to not make it. I brought you out to bring you in to the promised land. The Israelites wandered for 40 years. And all those people, 20 years and older, they dropped in the wilderness dead. God said, I never intended for that. I brought you out to bring you in. God said, I don't intend for Christians to walk around defeated, unhappy. I say this, we'll, we'll be through. We're done. There are, there are three things that I try to pray for every single day. I pray for the peace of God that passes understanding. Not peace with God, but the peace of God. I pray for the joy of the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I pray for perfect love. Because love hath not fear. Perfect love cast out fear. God, you didn't bring me out of Egypt to leave me in the wilderness. You brought me out to bring me in. But when we're fearful, when we're afraid, well, I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know what will happen. Yeah, but I know somebody who does. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he holds my hand. Father, we thank you again. Lord, help us to be like Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. Have I not commanded thee? Lord, we've come this far by faith, and Lord, we, we thank you, Lord for your love and your mercy and your grace to us. Lord, I was not content to jump in by the side of the pool. I wanted to get out there in the deep water. Lord, help us, we pray. Lord, to, by faith, because without faith, it is impossible to please you. By faith, to trust you, that you'll bring us through. Lord, thank you for each one of the dear folks who came today. I'm so glad they came. I thank you, Lord, for all the folks who are, who are watching us today. Lord, I'm thankful for them. Lord, again, help us not to be insubordinate, not help us not to be immobilized, but help us to be instructed, Lord, by fear. Lord, to put our foot into the Jordan River, and watch the divide. Everybody wants to see that. Everybody likes the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Everybody likes the story about Daniel and the lions, then. But Lord, sometimes we've got to get in the fire. Sometime in the lions, then. Help us, Lord, to be reminded that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Lord, thank you again for your goodness to us today. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll bless us, and Lord, that you would encourage us this week. Again, we pray for the safety and the well-being and the welfare of everybody in this church, that, Lord, you would just keep us safe. Again, Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, bless us, we pray, as we go. In thy holy and precious and wonderful name, amen and amen.